Hello friends and welcome back to the Bordeaux show. Today we'll discuss world building in world destruction. What happened before the flood? What was the antediluvian world? And how we can use mythology to tell our own stories. In this crusade, uh, the great Saint George will assist us and we will discuss some other mythologies I couldn't cover in my previous flood myth and many other stories, ideas that come from me because Flood was one of the most inspirational stories, uh, you would say, because I always wondered what really happened, what was the world like before the Flood, what happened to cause humanity to fall into depravity, why did we deserve the fate of such destruction? Other than that, it's always fascinated me how so many stories, how many, so many mythologies around the world cover this topic, to cover the topic of flood, destruction of the world, and its restart. And, of course, as I mentioned in the previous video, how it all kind of ended in the mountains of Caucasus. If you'll indulge me in my Rambolog video to ramble on about my childhood, where I first heard about this myth, is always fascinated me that humanity, according to both biblical accounts and many other world mythologies, was apparently far, far more advanced. If you use Bible as example, before the flood, humans lived about 900 years. Today, we are really fascinated about immortality or long, long longevity and how for example, in our modern pop culture, elves and demi-humans and demigods who live uh, not only 900 and a th almost a thousand years, but 200 and 300 year lifespan seems so magical and majestical to us. But according to most mythological accounts, humans lived for almost a thousand years, which is really fascinating to me that we went from a thousand year old lifespan and in one generation, we went down into, uh, according to some accounts, some legends, humanity was cursed and could only live to 120 to 130 years. I would say uh, quality of life for these people aren't that very high. But in mythological space, in the age of heroes, humans often lived more than 100 years, but less than a few hundred years as uh, before the flood age, humanity has existed. Learning about different mythologies and comparing it on my own before finding out there is a, a whole study of comparative mythology, I ha had created my own ideas, my own comparative uh, mythic ideas, and one of those interesting uh, ideas, especially related to the flood myth, we see in Hindu belief system, Kali Yuga, the cycle of death and rebirth, even of the world, that humanity has experienced multiple cycles of rise of civilization, its zenith and its destruction, and then starting from scratch and going on and on in this circle. And uh, we have a similar concept in Greek mythology of different ages of world, where humanity started from a golden age, a highly advanced society where it's said that golden age humans possess both spiritual and mental and physical high ca capabilities that we dined with the gods and we were considered almost equal to them. Then it said that their pride or their arrogance led their to, to their downfall. Then came age of silver, silver humans, where they weren't as spiritually advanced, but their mental and physical states were still really high. They lived long lives, but it is expanded that their lives were long, but it was mostly a short youth where they had a lot of fun, and then a long, long span of life where they were old and decrepit and struggling from uh, their age. And it is said that their lives ended because they went into depravity, stopped worshipping gods, and kind of fizzled out, not even uh, fell into destruction, just fizzled out. And after them came the Bronze Humans, the Great Bronze Age, not to be confused with uh, historical Bronze Age. And this Bronze Age was steeped in violence and battle and constant warfare. 
that gods had to destroy it because it was uh, uh, becoming far too noisy. This is where the flood happens. The flood destroyed this previous Bronze Age civilization. And there is this transitional period from humanity that still remembered and uh, still knew about the age of gods and heroes. This is the age of gods and heroes where we know all the mythological escapades took place such as um, Iliad, Odyssey, Jason and the Argonauts, that little thieving bastard who came here and stole our golden fleece and kidnapped our princes. And all those other heroic tales were set in the heroic age, which is transitional, and our age, well, technically, the Hellenistic age when uh, this idea came to be, was considered the Iron Age. Well, and this Iron Age was uh, the lowest humanity has ever gone to, we weren't even great in our physicality, in our mentality, in our spirituality. It is the lowest point. Our lives are short, stiffed with disease, hardship, and illness. And existence itself is struggle to survive. This is the age that we apparently live in. Learning about these different ages, mythologies, age of God, age of heroes, golden age, silver age, all those uh, fascinating worlds that got destroyed and we live in its shadow really fascinated me and really activated my imagination as a kid i used to love daydreaming because uh, reality was really unfortunate imagine living as a nerd in eastern europe it's not really fun and this gave me a lot of thought a lot of inspiration to make up my own theories, my own ideas, my own stories set in these worlds, set before the days of flood in the, in the anti-Diluvian age, where humanity lived thousands of years, magic and mystery was as real as sciences and technologies to us today, where different beings existed, different magical beings, of course, when you look at other mythologies, for example, Middle Eastern mythologies tells that before the flood, before even humanity, there were many other creatures like uh, Arabian mythologies, then, of course, influenced in Islamic uh, tales that jinns and uh, shaitan and other creatures, many, many other creatures that existed far before humans came to be. Like there is, I'm going off the top of my head here, but there were tales of Ari, Pari are fairies, Middle Eastern version of fairies, feminine magical creatures of the forest. There were jinn, there were shaitan, there were div, there were all these magical beings that existed far, far before humans came to be, and angels, of course. Angels were considered one of God's creations, with this uh, Ari, jinn, shaitan, uh, and other many, many, I'm, I'm going to and the Jani who are like separate from Jinn, and Jani actually means uh, might and strength in Georgian, which is probably more Arabian influence. According to most accounts, before our modern age of science and reason came about, humanity has existed, um, rose and fell many, many different times, and created many elevated states of being which resulted in humanity causing so much destruction upon this earth that it had to be destroyed by God or and or gods. And as a kid, I would spend a lot of times imagining what happened, what was this world, what was this age of uh, nigh mortal humans with other magical beings uh, living side by side. Then, then, of course, I found out internet and many other fantasy stories of other creative people who are inspired similar ways. I think Tolkien was similarly inspired because I th think, I'm not sure, again, off the top of my head, in the early draft at least, Tolkien thought of his Middle Earth as one of those ages, one of those pre-flood or pre-historical historical age and he's just a mere scribe retelling this uh, story of lost humanity where fairies humans dwarves elves all existed at the same time and of course my other favorite storyteller robert e howard and his and his conan tales which is actually set 
slightly after the flood but before recorded history where might and magic was still prevalent and the knowledge of the ancient arts was slowly being forgotten i really like conan stories due to the um, twilight of the gods uh, approach where barbarism and chaos of humanity juxtaposed with old elder beings and elder races that are slowly dying out some like underwater beings and different different like magical races who are slowly dying out and this new race of humans are slowly replacing it but they're barbaric and savage and some choose to learn about the magic and use it to terrorize with the like magical evil wizards who fight against conan and conan is unconcerned with the plights of civilization and chooses to live in the wilds like his ancestors but his ancestors are not savages like uba Uga buga savages but he, he is actually descendant from the line of survivors from the atlantis where he even his ancestors were once really advanced but had to survive in the wilds of the northern hyborian lands where frost and wind made harsher men who didn't concern themselves with writing and building great structures they lived in this hyborian lands of frost and forests where they much preferred to live closer to nature and avoid the trappings of civilization which only leads to destruction which is very fa fascinating to me trying to build civilization is doomed effort because like the story of nimrod and the tower of babel bigger you build harder it will fall later of course connecting this to our modern age humanity <laughs> was gifted with the gift of science by my boy prometheus but we chose to use the knowledge of fire to rather than help ourselves and elevate our lifestyles of course at some level did that but now building the modern equivalent of tower of babel where we're trying to reach gods reach into space humanity finally achieved what nimrod wanted we finally went into space went on uh, onto the moon man has finally returned to the space age which is one of my uh, fascinations as a kid i used to be more into science fiction than now i'm into more fantasy storytelling but as a kid learning about mythologies before i knew about complex mythological worlds i was more into science fiction if you know dexter's laboratory i basically mo modeled my kids self after dexter and wanted to be a boy genius unfortunately my aspirations um for being a boy genius and building my robots and gadgets was crushed by my teachers in the in the school which really really hated me for trying to learn their own subjects which i don't understand like dexter i wanted to be a boy genius trying i was trying to build robots and gadgets and devices and uh, but unfortunately i found out that math was related to science my school math teacher and my physics teacher were really angry at me trying to learn their subjects and uh, beat the la ever living crap out of me and beat all the, the joy I had towards science and mathematics and physics. So now I'm more concerned with fantasy and mythology because at least my history teacher didn't uh, hit me over the head constantly. Basically, as a kid, I was fascinated by mythology, but I tried to understand it in more quote unquote scientific, sci fi. I wouldn't say scientific, I would say sci-fi understanding that i theorize that all the gods from mythology all the monsters and beings were just a result of uh, <clears throat> some humans or some other beings other than noah and uh, some humans who survived from the flood you if you think about it a lot of god's temples where they say say gods resided in were on top of the mountains which would theoretically not have uh, flooded as much as other places and basically my theory was some humans from the pre-flood era who had a lot of knowledge scientific knowledge remained with their extended life with their 
greater understanding of technology, of sciences, of reason. But many of humanity, again, following the Tower of Babel story, humans who tried to, again, build an elevator into space, what I thought Tower of Babel was, those humans were punished and they fell into barbarism, fell into the Stone Age, and they slowly uh, went back up into what we are now. And the gods that they worshipped were this separate class of hum humanoids, let's just say, humanoids, who kept the scientific knowledge to themselves and used humans as cheap labor and as uh, playthings. We see similar idea, for example, in the story of Prometheus. Prometheus is portrayed as the creator of humans in Greek mythology. And only God or Titan, or how would you uh, prefer to describe them, who actually cared about humanity. But gods tried to punish humanity and took away fire from them. And Prometheus sacrificed himself brought the fire back to humanity. That's the important thing. Prometheus didn't give fire to humanity. Prometheus brought fire back to humanity. Fire, of course, is the first technology, like the main technology that you need to make everything else. From fire, you cook food, you make metal, you warm yourself, you do many other things. Well, fire has always been a symbol of technology, and Prometheus hero who sacrificed himself to bring knowledge and technology. Even Prometheus' name is forethought, thinking before you do something. And his brother Epimetheus is afterthought, being like, oh, what have I done? And I'm, okay, I really want to go into every mythology and uh, how it relates to my childhood theories about evil te techno gods who refuse to <laughs> treat humans well. Of course, I'm not the first one to think of this. I have not watched Ancient Aliens, more than a couple of clips on YouTube. And of course, my favorite, who kind of tackles this idea in a slightly different way, would be Jack Kirby and the Marvel comics, where gods are portrayed as like techno sci-fi beings with like, they do possess magic, but use like, use magic in more like a technological way, like there is no in differentiation between technology and magic. They treat humanity as like playthings, especially the new gods in DC Comics or Asgardians in Marvel Comics, which is a whole other topic. I'm not, it's a really interesting world building. I'm not going to go into that. But again, I'm trying to present that we can use mythology as both inspiration for as fairy tales, folklore, and fantasy stories, but we can use it also for sci-fi inspiration, as I did as a kid, and always try to look at age of heroes and gods. Again, going back to Greek understanding of age of golden age, silver age, bronze age that we know of, bronze age of constant warfare and blah, 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 and age of heroes. Age of heroes, to me, well, as a kid, I'd say I have a different mindset now, but still like those ideas as I had um, as a youngster, was more about that the difference between gods and humans was basically that the gods possessed that ancient pre-Diluvian knowledge and technology, and humans, poor humans, who once held those had those knowledge, devolved and devolved into savage barbarity. We actually see that happen many times throughout history. We kind of have this uh, view of history that it's a linear thing going into this modern age of technology that all oh, humans are barbarians. Before then, they didn't know anything. But then we gained knowledge, blah, 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 and came into this <clears throat> technological age. But if we actually look at Bronze Age was far more advanced. Maybe in the Bronze Age, they didn't have some technology that they had in the Middle Ages, but society was far more complex and far more advanced. They could build ziggurats, pyramids, 
uh, giant monolithic temples and stuff like that. Then that society collapses, goes into the dark age, where knowledge of writing, many technologies, bronze making, and many other uh, scientific advancements that were held gets lost. And then humanity has to relearn, regain that knowledge. Then humanity kind of goes back, kind of regains some of its footing. For example, Greek and uh, Roman age begins. And then the Greco-Roman world also collapses into medieval dark ages, where slowly, slowly humanity has to rebuild itself. Renaissance, the great technological leap, was actually just relearning and reacquiring knowledge, some of the knowledge that was lost from uh, great Greeks and Romans. Basically, the advancements that we have now is like from Greek age, which was some knowledge that survived from the Bronze Age, was rebuilt in the Greek age, Greco-Roman age. Again, this is very European biased. As a Caucasian, I know that Middle East and East Asia was doing its own thing, correlated, connected, but trying to keep it isolated in Europe. So Bronze Age knowledge gets lost. Greeks and Romans slowly try to rebuild it. Like uh, Greeks had fascinations with the uh, age of gods and heroes. Um, Romans had fascination with both Greek and Etruscan uh, glory, lost glory. And they slowly rebuilt it, rebuilt it, rebuilt it. Then society became large, complex, and it crumbled. Of course, Roman age didn't really crumble in our part of the world. Eastern Europe was still thriving in the Middle Ages, but some of the knowledge was still lost. Some of the knowledge, even in the Byzantine region, was also lost. And then again in the Renaissance, about a thousand years after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, slowly, slowly it get, um, started to rebuild, well, technically because uh, Byzantine society collapses and all of the wealthy people escaped into running away from Islamic conquests of uh, Arabians, uh, Persians, and, uh, of course, Turkic nom nomadic societies. And now our technological age, with our gadgets and devices, is uh, from the Age of Enlightenment, which came, of course, right after Renaissance and rebirth of this last lost knowledge, with, which is also rebirth of lost knowledge, which is also rebirth of no lost knowledge. Because if we go into stories and legends we have from the Bronze Ages, it also tells us that all humanity was so great in the past and we are but a shadow of it. My first dive into mythology was, of course, no shock, uh, Medea, cultures and the story of Argonauts and I was reading it from a Colchian perspective which painted much much more different picture than I think most of you have. I'm of course going to cover Jason, the Argonauts and Colchian's connection to the Greek world in the future, uh, hopefully near future. I have trying to look at it from a Colchian perspective, you get a different picture than you would get from looking at it from Greek perspective, which, oh, those heroes went out to bring uh, uh, a treasure and they found this, this magical witch, blah, 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 blah. But if you look at it from a Colchian perspective, you see a bunch of barbarians coming to an advanced society which has not magic, but technology, that these Greek, these Hellenistic barbarians confuse as magic, and our princess, Medea, is just a medicine woman, herbalist, a scientist, I would say, who has knowledge of plants, of minerals, of materials, she can use to her advantage, and this, like, Uga Booga, uh, the Jason and his bros consider her knowledge of plants, minerals, nature to be like this magical witchcraft. 
if we look at the same story, we find like flying metal birds who shoot metal arrows, which I thought were just planes. And I'm like, why is there a plane chasing Jason and the Argonas? They're like, oh, these metal planes are coming after me, which is, I don't know, a drone, like Bronze Age. Uh, I don't know, you get a different pictures of mythology if you look at it like uh, really uneducated people coming into uh, advanced technological society like jason having to plow a field with fire breathing bull which which i, I assumed was just a truck <laughs> like oh it breathes flame it's a oh it rumbles like a lion no it's just a it's just a truck man <laughs> One of the, the best example I found in this story was when Jason was going back to Greece and taking Medea with him. They came across Talos, the giant metal man, which I assumed was just a robot as a kid. And they were like, oh, this we cannot defeat this metal man. It is His flesh is unbreakable. And Medea just walks up to it and unplugs it. According to the myth, takes out the cork where magical icor was being held in the robot, and the icor spills, and the, the uh, bronze statue freezes. Which is, uh, I think, just I think Medea just unplugged this robot's uh, fuel container, and it uh, f flowed out, and it just stopped. Which is uh, what I'm trying to present here. Like you can look at mythology, yes, from a uh, fantasy perspective of. Oh, magical monsters and gods and wizards and uh, sorceresses. But you can also look at it as a post-apocalyptic world where most of humanity has fallen into savage Uga Booga state where they ha have no ancestral knowledge of technology and they assume every scientific mach every machine and device is something magical and made by gods. But like, oh, look at this magic mirror that can tell future, has a calculator in it and can record audio. Oh, look at this magical metal which is made out of made by wizards combining two different metals this is this is the most obvious example of how oh, technology of bronze making was considered sacred magic to most of society but blacksmith knew it was scientific process of combining two different metal to create a uh, much stronger and better alloy like one of the mythological narratives that I wanted to mention is the golden apple. Golden apple, of course, we uh, the magic apple or magic fruit that gives you powers. We, of course, find this uh, uh, tree of knowledge. I'll make a special dedicated video covering this m mythic narrative. But we often find in stories that there is this magical tree with magical apple quote-unquote apples if you eat it it gives you long life and if you eat the other tree it gives you divine knowledge basically what makes god special is that they have access to this magical fruit that gives them immortality and godlike knowledge humanity was driven from the garden of eden because either it's been implied that adam has eaten from the tree of longevity and then their sin was to eat from the tree of knowledge. So there is two trees, actually. Tree of knowledge and tree of immortality. Maybe there's uh, the, the, the different interpretations, different mythological narratives. But basically, that's what makes gods, spe gods special. That they have access to those apples that they can use to, apples in quotes, of course, to gain their immortality and divine st status. And humanity's sin, Adam and Eve's sin, was trying to eat those apples. Going back to the flood story, there are many accounts, uh, mythological and non-canonical, I'm going uh, out of the Bible sphere, of course, uh, that there are, uh, there are many other people, many other creatures who survived the flood, either going into the underworld into where the f flood waters couldn't reach or going on top of the mountains 
or finding other ways to survive the flood. And many of those magical beings that we find, for example, in Caucasian mythology, we have one of the stories of Masipae. Masipae, I'll cover, of course, in the further detail in the future video, are water-dwelling creatures, um, mermen, let's say, who live on the bottom of the Black Sea, who sometimes come out to the land to hunt and go back in into the waters. They are considered very spooky and dangerous and unknowable creature of great power. And if you are lucky to, to survive that encounter, but they can be friendly and uh, the evil, who knows, they're, they're as complex as any other being. But these beings, this Masipayam, I found a legend where it's told that they were actually humans at one point. Before the flood, the king of the world, the ruler of the world, punish this group of people by banishing them under the waves. So they must remain on the bottom of the sea. And because they started living on the bottom of the sea, they actually survived the deluge, the destruction of the world. And they kept the knowledge and mystery of the pre-flood world. And there are many other creatures and mythological beings that live for example, Kaji, who live on, inside the caves that span across Caucasian mountains that actually go into a whole other world that is on the bottom of the mountains. The Caucasus is famous for its caves, actually. There are many, many caves and tunnels, which apparently all uh, lead in the bottom world, the underworld, where many magical beings and creatures reside in. And, of course, giants, Devi, who survived by climbing the top of the mountain. And only two of them survived. And the, 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 that's why they all look weird, because all of them are inbred or something. Basically, mythological Caucasian world was transformed by Christian interpretations of who the, that these creatures, these beings that reside in underworld, in the forest, in the bottom of the sea, on top of the mountains, all of them are just beings that survive the flood and are the enemies of humanity. One, one other story is actually that devs, the giants, live under the oceans, under the waves, because they fear Saint George and his wrath, because Saint George with his thunder spear can pierce, here's the thunder spear, Bronze Age, a uh, 3,000 year old spear I have here, which this is probably a javelin uh, rather than a hoe used to for throwing. And Saint George, oh, his mission is to mm, protect humanity and go around the waves and storms and banish any giant who tries to uh, take their head out of the waters and kill them. Same narrative goes into the mountains that giants, Caucasian giants, the Devi, were banished into the underworld and any Devi that comes out of the mountains has to, uh, and you find one of them, you have to pray to the Saint George or other um, Caucasian he god heroes and uh, uh, he will protect you and banish them back into the underworld. Saint George is a really interesting figure in Georgian understanding. Of course, we love Saint George so, so much, we named a whole country after it, Georgia. Georgia's name origins a completely different topic, but we call ourselves Sakartvelo, but uh, Western scholar Saint uh, Georgia. One version is because we venerate George so much, they call us land of uh, Saint George. The other, more realistic, is that Georgia, Geo means earth, geography, uh, and uh, Georgia means land of earth workers, according to Greeks, Gr Greeks and Romans. And St. George is actually not Georgian, but really close, Cappadocia, Cappadocia, or I don't know how you Americans pronounce it. Cappadocia is region at the south of Anatolia, where and neighbors Georgia, and a lot of ethnic Kartvelians used to reside here, and ethnic Armenians and different ethnicities. Then, of course, Greeks conquered this territory. Then it used to be under uh, 
different different control under some at some points georgian control armenian control there are many the caucasian ethnicities residing there currently it's under turkey but when christianity spread it spread a lot in this area one of the uh, main hubs of christianity was cappadocia there are many underground churches and Basically, this area was one of the first to take on Christianity, and many Cappadocian saints actually spread Christianity into Armenia and Georgia, Armenia being first country, there are few years, just few years before us, and Georgia became uh, Christian later on. We are Christianized, funny enough, by uh, St. George's cousin, uh, St. Nino. This is St. Nino. Saint Nino, I'm I'm gonna tell her story in the future as well. According to Christian lore, Christian canon, they are cousins. And uh, Saint George, of course, if you don't know, is a Roman legionary who converted to Christianity when his general forced him to either abandon his faith or die. He chose to die for his faith, and they tortured him many times, many times over. And according to Christian lore, every time they tortured him and left him to die, he miraculously got healed and they tortured him again, again, and there's a whole cycle of his torture. But neither time did he repent and uh, abandon his faith. And because of that, he became a saint. But you might be familiar uh, with his more heroic es escapades. Well, here, wait a minute. Where Saint George battles the dragon, Saint George um, canonically is dead and is a saint who miraculously appears and defeats the dragon. I'm going to go into Saint George historian's uh, lore in the future, but just want to paint a picture here. This specific icon is actually icon of Lomisis uh, Saint George. When Christianity spread into Georgia. St. George was one of the main icons, main ideals Georgian Christians gravitated towards. And actually many, many uh, godsons, heroes, gods, and pre previous um, idols converted into becoming St. George. They got St. Georgified. Um, this is this particular is um, Lomisi St. George, Lomisi is uh, Lomis's bull is previous uh, mountain Georgian uh, idol, which then became Saint George. There are over three hundred and sixty-five different Saint George temples, which are all previous pagan temples of old heroes. There is, for example, Kopala is an old godson, and the, the temple dedicated to Kopala became Kopala Saint George temple and there are there's white saint george uh Natsiliani saint george many many ba basically according to legend saint george was cut up into 365 pieces and each piece became its own saint george that uh each temple in georgia has a piece of claims to have a piece of saint george be it thumb or be it i don't know nose or other part which uh, became a hati icon that actually protects them from uh, evil spirits such as uh, giants and um, deviant kaji and other monsters from Georgian folklore. I wanted to go on this aside because I wanted to present how the old mythology, when Christianity came, became part of Christian lore, where old warrior gods became Saint George and the stories got continued, like names got changed, but stories kept the same. One of the stories actually related to the flood, why I'm telling you uh, this whole ramble about St. George, I couldn't cover in the video because it's it's not a flood story. It's an almost a flood story. There's a story of La Maria and St. George. La Maria is um, Ushgulian, Svanetian, highest of the high villages in Georgia is Ushguli where there is a church, La Maria's, uh, which is currently the church dedicated to Mother of God, Saint Mary, but previously was La Maria, which is a fertility 
goddess in in the Sanatian pantheon. That's according to the story Saint George. We don't know uh, Jgriagi, which is really interesting. That Jgriagi is Saint George, which became a god, then converted back into a saint. Like as I've tried to demonstrate here, many figures, many male warrior figures. Um, then got converted into Saint George. An interesting thing that happened in Swanetian Mountains is that Saint George himself became a god, god of warriors and heroes, Chgriag, Chgriagi. There is a legend about Chgriagi and uh, Lamaria. Lamaria is a goddess and protector of Ujguli. <clears throat> Saint George, Chgriagi, or God George, Chgriagi, fell in love with Lamaria and asked her for marriage. Lamaria refused uh, his hand in marriage. So St. George in anger ordered that Devi to build a dam to flood a river so after uh, so he could break the dam and then flood all of Ujguli. Devi built this dam and when it got, uh, started to fill, Lamaria prayed to God, highest of the high gods, for aid and God told her, to take one of her rams and send him uh, to break the dam. Uh, ram ran up to the dam and crushed it with his horns, couldn't break it, crushed it with his horns again, and finally prayed to God, the lamb prayed to God, and gained enough power to break the dam. Hopefully dam wasn't filled with water enough to, so it could flood the poor Ujgulians. But... Our poor ram lost both of his horns, which I wanted to tell this story here because I wanted to show how uh, fluid and how non-existent uh, sometimes uh, the dividing line between paganism, religion, Christianity, saints and ancient heroes truly are. One such myth I wanted to mention uh, just briefly, another flood myth, but it's more of an earth diver myth, but creation of the world according to Georgian mythology. One version I found in a um, Russian book about Georgian mythology and folklore, so I have to both read it in Russian, translate it in Georgian, then translate it in English. So I do a lot of mental gymnastics. <laughs> and... This particular story, again, I'm translating a translation of a translation that I'm translating in English. The story goes that before Earth was created, the world was covered in water, but and God resided in heavenly mountains. Again, Caucasus mountains, very important. And God jumped from the mountain, dove into the ocean, trying to find the Earth to create land. When he dove into the sea, the cosmic sea, the primordial ocean, um, from his eyes came two teardrops. One teardrop became Archangel Michael, the other teardrop became Archangel Gabriel. Unfortunately, God dove so deep into the ocean, he was almost about to drown, and archangels brought him up from the depth of the cosmic ocean. Then three of them decided to blow uh, as hard as they could and they created mighty wind and blew water from the uh, from the mud from the sludge uh, below it and they blew they blew they blew they tried to build walls and dams to keep water out of the material plane but every time they rested the stones broke off and the world flooded again once again they were trying to blow water away and they found on the bottom of the uh, cosmic ocean on the muddy floor some footprints god and his two archangels decided to follow those footprints and found a blue rock god was angry with this rock and tried to kick it archangels warned him not to kick the rock something bad will happen but god still kicked the blue rock this blue rock shattered and from it jumped the devil or technically it's Samael but in reality it's the trickster uh, antagonist the devil the trickster god who immediately jumped on god and tried to choke life out of him both archangels Michael and Gabriel are trying their best to pry the evil devil's hand off god but they couldn't 
So the God begged the devil to spare his life and ask him anything he wants. The devil asked him to be brothers, to swore brotherhood. In Georgian folklore and in a lot of ancient folk beliefs, swearing brotherhood is really important. I can, I'll make a little parallel with Scandinavian mythology and how Loki tricks a god is blood brothers with Odin. Similarly, they become blood brothers, twins, cosmic twins. Again, another cosmic twin narrative. Devil lets him go and they're brothers now, apparently. But again, God continues trying to build his dam, trying to keep water out of the material plane he's trying to build. But every time he builds a dam, he builds a wall surrounding the world. It breaks and water rushes in and floods the world. God decides to send one of his archangels, Michael or Gabriel, depends on the version, to ask the devil for advice. How can they stop the flooding? The devil teaches him that one, you have to build a wall it will cr and crumble and crush it. Build a wall and crush it. After you get tired, you have to break the stone and get the metal out of it and use that metal to forge mighty horns and blow those horns until you get tired. And after you get tired, the waters will recede and water will know its place apart from the air. So Archangel uh, Michael and Gabriel brings the information back. The God does as instructed. They build the wall, destroy it, build the wall, destroy it, make a mighty horn, blow that mighty horn, and the world finally settles. After the world settles, the devil comes to God and demands his tithe. God says, nothing is owed to you. We did it on our own. But the devil says, we swore brotherhood. How can you betray me? So the devil asks for tithe, for sacrifice. Every sacrifice given to God would go to to the devil and the devil puts it in his mouth and goes back to hell. After some time passes, Jesus is born and Jesus uh, with his uh, friends from humans to serpents, all of them go into the underworld to finally get the tithe back. Now Jesus chokes the life out of the devil. The devil spits out the sacrifice. Jesus grabs the sacrifice and goes back up into the world. But angry devil blinds the world, creates darkness upon hell, and God and his entourage cannot find his path out. They walk around for two months in the blindness. No, no one can find their way out of the underworld. Until God asks one of his compatriots, one of his uh, entourage, to help him. And the man says that, I left my donkey on the entrance of the hell, on the entrance of the underworld, I can call out to him and he will guide us back from the underworld. Uh, but I demand a payment for it to cover me with gold. Jesus says, of course, I am Jesus, I will do as you ask. So the man calls out to his donkey, donkey answers. Jesus and his entourage finally uh, follow the voice of donkey and they come out of the underworld. Bring gold to cover him, but the man gets his heart out from his sleeve and says, no, do not cover me, cover my heart with gold. They cover the heart with gold, heart is still beating, jumps out, cover it with gold, jumps out. Jesus finally runs out of gold and he's confused, what do I do now? And the man grabs black dirt, covers his own heart and his heart stops. And that's how humanity becomes mortal. And only act that will stop a man is being covered in dirt, aka being dead and buried. There are many other strange legends I found in this Russian book about Georgian uh, mythology that has a lot of tales that are recast by biblical figures, but are still the same stories, the same pagan old stories, but with biblical names. One of the stories I am not going to get into uh, has Elijah, biblical prophet, as a storm god. So Elijah is a storm god. Jesus is just another god and Saint George is venerated more by shepherds and that's the story where Elijah, Jesus and Saint George are walking down the path. They get hungry and ask a local shepherd to give them the sheep. First Elijah goes to the shepherd 
And Shepherd tells him, I'm not going to give you any of my food. You don't know good from bad. You bring storm and hail and uh, thunder that frightens my uh, sheep and I will not help you. So Elijah goes back. Then Jesus comes. Uh, Shepherd tells him that you do not know difference between good and bad and I will not assist you. I will not give you my sheep. Then St. George comes and St. George tells him that I am your patron saint of your nation. And Shepherd finally bows to him and tells him that you can take all of my sheep because all of my flock belongs to you. But St. George tells him, no, I just want one of your sheep to feed my friends. So he gives one of his best and thickest and juiciest uh, sheep to the to St. George, and St. George blesses the shepherd. Th then the story goes when Elijah tries to curse uh, the shepherd and uh, St. George protects him. Then Jesus tries to ruin his day. St. George warns him and that's a whole narrative I'm not going to go into. But I wanted to showcase how pagan stories became recast and retold with biblical figures. Very similar thing I found while watching Crow Hag, which is another YouTuber who covers Balkan and Romanian uh, fairy tales and mythology. Check their channel out. I personally appreciate that rather than forget and cast out those old stories when new ideology, new faith came along, humans uh, can recast, retell those stories and keep the ideas, the narratives alive. Because humans have very limited lifespan. Once we may have lived for 900 and plus years, but currently going beyond 120 something is really difficult. And telling stories, telling narratives, telling ideas, sharing ideas with, the, with your predecessors, your, with your ancestors, this is the way society, culture, and people are immortalized. People who made up those stories are long, long dead, but though their ideas, their beliefs still live on in us. So I think as a storyteller, it is important to try to learn the ancient tales of our forefathers and use those stories as inspiration to tell more modern stories and keep the legacy alive. So thank you for watching. I hope uh, I didn't bore you with my uh, mad ramblings and great thanks again to my sponsors who keep the channel alive i have great great plans for the future and if you'd like to support me consider joining my patreons the great patron saints of this channel or if you aren't able uh, you could consider liking commenting giving me your suggestions and i appreciate if you watch my other videos other content so <laughs> YouTube says that my channel is alive and growing. Uh, thank you all. I really appreciate your watching my video, especially till the end. And take care.